I should, I should preface my talk by saying that I will present to you not general knowledge, I will present to you a biased point of view that has been developed by my colleagues of, of mine and myself over the last, uh, I would think, 25 years, in which we have done work at the cognitive control system. To give you some history, in, in psychiatry, mood disorders in general, and depression in particular, have been viewed as a disorder of the emotional structures and the emotional networks of the brain. Um, our view has been that the emotional networks are part of the game and that an important part of what allows depression to occur, especially in late life, is a disturbance of the cognitive control system. So this is the biased view that I will describe to you today and they will tell you where that takes us in developing novel treatments. Now, to start with definitions, the cognitive control system is a system of the brain that encompasses the dorsal anterior cingulate gyrus. This is the gyrus that sits on top of the corpus callosum and the dorsolateral prefrontal uh, cortex, which, and so that is the conservative definition, there are other structures that collaborate with the cognitive control system that we may discuss as we proceed. So the idea is, that I will present to you, is that a disturbance of the cognitive control system allows disinhibition of the emotional structures of the brain to express themselves pathologically and result in the complex syndrome of major depression. Now, why should we do that kind of work in the brain of old people as opposed to in the brain of young people? Well, there are, there are reasons to believe that the cognitive control system, meaning the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, um, are preferentially impaired in late life. Well, there are two, two reasons to believe that. First, brain aging impairs that system. May I ask the audience a question? How many of you believe that we lose brain cells as we age? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Only a minority of you, that's very interesting. In fact, you're wrong, my friends. We do not lose that many brain cells as we age. Look at me, you came to listen to me. Well, <laughs> um, what we do lose, what we do lose in late life is brain connections. As we age, there is, there is an impoverishment of the brain. So we lose preferentially volume of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. We lose white matter. We lose about 50% of, of the length of myelinated fibers is reduced. So what we lose in late life is connections. And that is why the brain volume is shrinking. And what we also do is that we see this, this impairment preferentially in the structures of the cognitive control system. Second reason to, to believe that the cognitive control system is impaired is that, is that vascular lesions happening in almost all of us who age impair particularly that system. And this excerpt is from the paper of vascular depression hypothesis in which indicates that what is happening in the vascular system when we develop depression is there is an impairment in, in, in the connections between the prefrontal systems and the emotional, <coughs> and the emotional structures. Uh, further, 
in a more recent work, there has been a, an association between vascular risk factors and severity of depression on the one hand, so linking it to depression. And second, there is a, an association between vascular, uh, vascular risk factors and executive impairment, meaning the cognitive, the cognitive symptoms that you develop when the cognitive control structures are impaired by vascular, by vascular damage. Uh, let, let me review quickly what we have found in our laboratory, both on the clinical, the structure and neuroimaging, and the functional neuroimaging level of the cognitive control system. Now, clinical studies. What we have seen relatively early is that by looking at depressed people you, of, of late life, all depressed people, by the way, all that I have to say and pretty much all that I know it is about late life depression. So, so I'm not, if I don't say old, assume it is old. There's nothing that we do with young people. Um, so wh what we have shown is that depressed old people have problems with executive function. What does this mean? They have problems with response inhibition. They have problems with active switching from one set to another. They have problems with processing speed and with manipulation of complex concepts. So late life depression does not come alone. It comes with executive dysfunction. Another important finding has been that late life depression I'm sorry, in late life depression, problems with response inhibition demonstrable with the Stroop test are associated with poor response to classical antidepressants. We have shown that with the antidepressant nortriptyline and subsequently with an SSRI antidepressant, citalopram, and most recently with escitalopram. Now, we took it further and we, took, we tried to find a test that is very simple, simple enough to do at the bedside without new, using neuropsychologists. And we looked at the, at the fluency, fluency test, part of the Mantis dementia, uh, Mantis dementia rating scale. And we identified, this is a test that you ask people to, to tell you as many items as they can buy in a supermarket over a period of one minute. So the whole test takes one minute. And then we try to see how they cluster them. So if you, I don't go to a supermarket, so if I ask, if you ask me to do that test, I would first speak about vegetables, then I would speak about cheese, and then I would speak about meat, and so on. And after a while, I have two, three, two, three groups of, of items that you can buy. Now, the number of items that, the number of clusters that you have is the strongest predictor of poor response to antidepressant treatment. Then we looked at the memory test, and again, the clustering of items, again, was a very a strong response of antidepressant treatment. Now, clustering is, an, is a, a strategy, is a cognitive strategy that puts things together. So losing the ability to have that cognitive strategy, to form that cognitive strategy, is a strong indication, clinical indication, of impairment of the cognitive control system and predicts poor response of depression to treatment, arguing that this is an important function for the that I mentioned two tests, is that the clustering ability is independent of the task that you try to use. So you can use that in a, mem in a fluency task or in a memory task. Again, the clustering ability, which is indicative of the cognitive control system, is what predicts poor response to depression. Again, I, all of this is clinical evidence that the cognitive control system is a major player in, re in development of depression and in sustaining depression meaning making it resistant, resistant to antidepressant treatment. Now, this, are these findings only of ours? We started this, but the, the findings have been replicated 
by in eight different phases, and one of which from the Catania group in Sicily. Now, what happens at the structural imaging level? Do we, do we see evidence of cognitive control impairment when we look at brain structures? The answer is yes, and let me just quickly show you some slides. This is a, the volumes of the dorsal anterior cingulate, a central structure. This is the distribution center of the brain. This is where, when you receive information either from, from the uh, body or from the environment, the first processing station is that the dorsal anterior cingulate and it funnels the information up on the neocortex. So we have seen that people who remit after antidepressant treatment have higher volumes of the anterior cingulate cortex, both the dorsal and the, and the rostral uh, part of the cingulate, compared to people who fail to re remit with antidepressant treatment. We also looked at white matter hyperintensity volumes at frontal areas. White matter, is, white matter hyperintensity is characterized late life depression. And we noticed that patients with white matter hyperintensities uh, with high volume of hyperintensities fail to respond to antidepressant treatment. And those who respond with antidepressant, to antidepressant treatment have hyperintensity volumes similar to those of old controls. Finally, we observed, we used a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, and we measured fractional anisotropy, which is an index of, of microstructure abnormalities in areas of the brain. We focused it, we put the regions of interest lateral to the anterior cingulate cortex. And we, fo and we found that people with microstructure abnormalities fail to respond to antidepressant treatment compared to people who did not. So what you see here is survival analysis, time to remission in patients with and in patients without fracture anisotropy. And finally, we replicated this finding with a study that used voxel-wise wise, uh, analysis of images. And what you see in the, in the orange areas are the areas of microstructure lesions in the white matter of people who fail to respond to antidepressant treatment. Uh, so the next group of studies used functional neuroimaging, again, studying the same system. And what you see here is a functional connectivity study of patients of, at a state of rest. They, we asked them to do nothing, to think of nothing, and, um, and not to sleep. And what we have found, it was a double dissociation. We found that people with depression had enhanced, increased functional connectivity in the, in the default mode network that you see on the, as you look at it on the right side of the slide, and they had reduced functional connectivity in the cognitive control system that you see on the left side of the slide. Now, we looked at the default mode network and we found that the default mode network connectivity was correlated with pessimism at baseline. But the default mode connectivity did not predict response to treatment. So we treated all these patients with the antidepressant escitalopram, and then we noticed that the cognitive control system functional connectivity predicted poor response to escitalopram and this executive behavior. So people with poor cognitive control connectivity had this executive behavior on the one hand and poor response to antidepressant treatment, again confirming the role of the cognitive control network at a functional connectivity level. So the question, though, is, OK, these are all theories. What do you do with that? What, what do they all have to do with treatment? Or to put it in a different way, if you develop a theory in medicine, medicine is about helping patients. 
So if you develop a theory, it better come tr and translate to treatment because that's what medicine is about. So, so having the view that the cognitive control system is an important system in late life depression, we try to develop a therapy that was used in young adults, problem solving therapy, and we modified it such that they can enhance the, the skills, the problem solving skills of depressed old people who are lacking these skills. And we call that problem, uh, problem solving therapy for executive dysfunction. And what that does is that it improves, it remedies, it remedies the behavioral deficits of patients we have to do with executive dysfunction. And here's what we found. Problem solving therapy compared to another therapy, supportive therapy, which itself is not a placebo, it is an effective therapy, improved late life depression with executive dysfunction. The very syndrome that we have shown that fails to respond to antidepressant drug therapy. And what you see on the side of the slide, on the right side of the slide, is that about 56, 57 percent of patients who received problem solving therapy met criteria for response to antidepressant treatment, and only 34 percent of patients who received supportive therapy did so. We looked at disability, and disability, disability is an important dimension in, of, of health in that group, and we have seen differences between supportive therapy and problem-solving therapy as well. And not only we saw differences during treatment, which was 12 weeks, 12 sessions, 12 weeks, but these differences in disability persisted over a period of 36 weeks. So, so 24 weeks after treatment, the patients remain equally well, and if anything, their disability improved further. Now, the next thing that we did is we, we targeted the cognitive control system with a computer game, for lack of a better word, that improved cognitive control. And the, uh, the patients come and sit in front of the computer for a couple of hours every day, five days a week. And they improve their cognitive performance by playing a game that becomes increasingly demanding. And in fact, the computer program is very complex because as you have to maintain a certain level of difficulty. If it is too easy, they do not learn, they do not improve their function. And if it is too difficult, they don't Im improve their function either. So every five trials, the computer game becomes more difficult by assessing the speed and the accuracy of the response of, of patients. This is a collaboration with Yale University. And what we have seen is that the more hours they have and the better the skills become, if you, I don't have the index here, but you would see as the as they, more skills they develop, they depression symptoms drop. So what you, you see, all but one, one subject failed to improve with that system. This is cognitive, co cognitive remediation. And we have also shown that tests of executive function, like the TRAILS B and the Stroop co uh, Color Word test, improved as well compared to the control group. Now, uh, it, it, in my view, it would be simplistic to assume that cognitive control is the only, the only dysfunction in depression of late life. Uh, the argument that, is, that I, I am making is cognitive control allows, is a key player, is an important player in the brain, but it actually allows dysfunction in other systems to come forward. In particular, what my most recent view and the most recent set of studies that we're developing is that impairment the cognitive control system allows the positive valence network to express itself. So if you have, le let me just make it simple. If you wake up in the morning and you have a number of worries, well, I need to make so many phone calls, I need to pay income tax, 
I need to call Professor X and Z and Y and, and, and argue about a certain point that I think is important. I have to give a lecture, see six patients and so on. All of these things make your day miserable, but you wouldn't let that happen if you have a good cognitive control system. You would suppress these thoughts. If you fail to suppress these thoughts, all of this is going to come up, overwhelm you, make you depressed, paralyze you. You wouldn't get up from bed. You wouldn't do a thing. So, so taking that view, we looked at, that, at the processing of reward. Well, the processing of reward is abnormal in depression. And the processing of punishment also is abnormal in depression both at the human level and at the animal level. So what we did with that, uh, I don't have that slide. So what we did with that is we developed a very simple therapy that is based on behavioral activation and also it targets a number of areas that can serve as, as barriers to behavioral activation. Behavioral activation is very simple and therapy should be very simple because otherwise the use of complex therapies at the practical level, at the community level, as you heard earlier, is almost negligible. First, they don't, they're not applied right and very few people have the inclination to learn complex techniques and apply them in everyday clinical practice. So psychotherapy, unlike a tablet, when you take 10 milligrams of S-Italopram, you have the certainty that you take 10 milligrams of S-Italopram because of regulations and simplicity. When you take th any therapy you want, mention it, cognitive behavior therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, six different therapies give six different versions of this and they're not standardized. So it's important to make the therapy very simple so it can be standardized. So behavioral activation is a, is, a, a system, is a system of therapy that increases meaningful and rewarding activities and systematically pushes the patient to use these activities in everyday life. So it, you actually ask the patient to make an appointment with himself and do the activity that he says is meaningful to him. And then if he does not do that activity, then you look at barriers at various other areas, like negativity bias, like apathy, or emotional discontrol. And we applied that therapy in, in patients with late life depression, and we compared it with historical controls receiving problem solving therapy. And we found that, that both therapies perform equally well in reducing depression and the, with a remission rate of approximately 40% and in reducing this. So to conclude, what I argued with you today is that aging and vascular disease damage the cognitive control system, a system that imaging and clinical studies suggest to be impaired in depression. The importance of that system on a clinical level is that it is associated with poor response to classical antidepressant drugs. And what I also have argued with you, that focusing on the clinical control system and its association with a positive valence system, it can improve the development of new treatments and gave you examples of the, and the problem solving therapy on the one hand, but also of the cognitive remediation therapy targeting the clinical control, the cognitive control system, as well as the more recently developed therapy, engaged therapy, that assumes an interaction between the positive and negative valence network system, as well as the cognitive control system. I have to apologize that for the bias, the bias that I try to convey to you today, I hope that you will receive this bias kindly because it is intended to develop new theory on which to build new therapies that can be applied not only in laboratories, but be simple enough to be applied in the community. So I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your questions.